starting bell. <laughs> Um, before I begin, I'm going to raise an emotional issue for you guys. How's that? Do you know, did you notice that um, when I began to talk about the spirit body and those kind of concepts, all of a sudden all of you start to increase your energy, your, your interest increased substantially. Did you notice that? And you notice when I was talking about love, truth and humility, the interest is not so high. Did you notice that? Yeah. Yeah. I did the interest. Now, that's, that, this is a generalisation for the audience. The fact that your interest in the spirit body and the discussion about the spirit body and the soul and those kind of discussions is higher is an indication that you are more interested in metaphysics than you are in love. And, and remember I said to you that actually these three principles have the highest amount of laws evolved in them, they have the highest amount of truths involved in them, and they are going to be necessary for your in complete future development, like right the way through eternally, your eternal future development. Now, what that indicates to me is the same as what it indicates to, many, uh, to me when I visit many other audiences. And that is we have this very strong interest and desire to talk about the nuts and bolts of things, but a very low interest and desire to talk about the real things that control our entire life. And, and this is where I feel the majority of audiences that I'm speaking to still don't understand these particular three things. They feel that that's boring, and this discussion is more interesting. You see, for me, it's the exact opposite to that. I find this discussion boring, <laughs> and this discussion more interesting. And as you develop further and further in love and truth, you will find the same shift happening inside of yourself. You will actually find your interest in the physical phenomena is actually, actually reduces in comparison in comparison to your interest in the laws surrounding the true development of your soul. So what I would uh, suggest to you to do, throughout this further discussion that we go through now, I'll discuss some of these nuts and bolts things here, these physical phenomena, if you could call it that. But what I would love to do is to refer them back to this, so that you can see the relationship between understanding this inside of your heart, now, in the first century, I used a term, a, 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 state, a statement or a slogan. I said, out of the heart's abundance, the mouth speaks. You've heard that sound? It's a quote from, that's now in the Bible. Your questions come out of your heart's abundance. The fact that you're more questioning of these things, the physical phenomena, means the heart is more connected to the physical phenomena. And it's less connected to these principles of love, truth and humility. Now I would like to suggest to you that in time, if you can develop a desire to be more connected to these. Can I illustrate? When I talk about love, there is literally thousands of laws involved in the aspect of love. And yet we've, never dis we've not even yet discussed it. One of them. With truth, when I talk about truth, there are literally millions of truths that you can actually discern and find out about. And yet we ask very few questions about them. And with regard to humility, there is a lot of emotional content in our souls, and yet we have very little interest in discovering it. And yet, those three things are the essential parts of your future life's progression. This is now discussing what actually happens. This is discussing how you can discover what happens. Now to me, how is better always to learn how than it is to learn what. 
It's a bit like there's this old saying, isn't there, that you can teach a man, uh, sorry, you can give a man a fish or you can teach him how to fish. Right? When I'm talking about these things with you, I'm giving you a fish. When I talk about this with you, I'm teaching you how to fish. There's a big difference between those two places. And the fact that we are more interested in this means we are more interested in getting a fish than we are in learning how to fish. And that is an issue that we have to face. Why isn't, I mean, why isn't that natural for us to, to, to uh, take our focus on that one? Uh, there are some very good reasons why. Um, one primary reason why is that on the earth we are so used to having someone else tell us or give us things rather than having to go through the process of self-discovery. We, we want other people to, who, have, who have already discovered it to, to, to just tell us so that we don't have to go through the actual process ourselves of self-discovery. And that is a major problem for our future development because in the end all of us are totally capable of discovering ourselves the truths of the universe rather than needing another person. But unfortunately, because of the way we've been brought up generally, we always are focusing too much on needing other people to tell us rather than being taught how to do it ourselves. And if you look at all of our education, all the way through primary school and high school, uh, I don't know what school, different layers of schools you have here, but in Australia we have a primary school and a secondary education, and, and then we have university education. If you look all the way through these forms of education that we take nowadays, most of the time we're being taught like what rather than how, unfortunately. And in particular, anything to do with our soul, we very rarely learn how, and mostly it's said, taught what. Mary? To me it feels like learning has become a vulnerable thing for humanity. It feels yes. like a fear-inducing exercise to say, I don't know, I have to learn. I, 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 there's uncertainty. and Can you instead speak louder, of... please? <laughs> She's thinking about it now that she can. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no. I was saying that to me it feels like the process of learning has become vulnerable for humanity. We feel vulnerable when we don't know something. We feel open to humiliation or judgment. And um, it feels to me that when we're children, there's wonder in, in our learning, but that is quickly replaced with a sense of, I'm less than if I don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I feel like we want to know, we want the fish instead of learning how to fish. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're a child, what Mary's basically stating is when we're a child, we have this wonder in everything, this joy of discovery in everything generally. But as we grow, it's normally suppressed through, throughout our experience. A lot of times through punishment, don't you know that already? What's wrong with you? You know, those kind of statements cause us to be resistive to the process of learning. And now we either want to be told or we won't admit anything. We don't admit, we can't even admit that we don't know anymore because we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to get away with it without being ridiculed in some way. And this is a major problem too for humanity. The third reason why it's a major problem is that love is not seen on the earth as something very important. The case in point is that we, we, we readily revert to violence, which is an indication of how much love is not important to us. Also, truth is not seen as very important because, there's, because most of us have become disillusioned with the dis potential discovery of universal truth. We, we become disillusioned because we're taught all these different things and none of them seem to make full sense to us. And so after a while we go, oh, well, there's that possibility, and there's that possibility, there's that possibility, but I don't really know what the truth is. And it seems the more we learn, the less we're certain about it. And uh, my suggestion, if, if we were actually learning divine truth, the more we learn, the more we're certain about. So it's sort of the opposite. But unfortunately on earth, there's this general food viewpoint that the more you learn, the less you're certain about, and so there's more doubt, and therefore more confusion. And then a lot of people decide to stop learning for that reason, because it just feels like there's too much for confusion to add to... Uh, to add some more confusion too. And so we become very um, resistant 
to the process of learning after that. So I feel there are a lot of emotional reasons why we are less interested in these things and more interested in these things. Yeah. But we are not, I mean, we are not going in the way of love. Uh, I mean, we're, we have been living for, for many years now and, and uh, I think that uh, we are not going in the way of love. And, I agree. And, and you are talking about it and many people are talking about it and we can understand it, but uh, in some way we don't take it to us. And, uh, well, uh, the problem is, is that we think we understand it. But the problem with every, uh, with love in particular, is that love is a feeling and an emotion, and it has to be felt to be understood. And so, unfortunately, we can listen to a talk that talks about love or humility or truth, and we think, yeah, I, I get that, I get that, I get that, I get that. And then in the very next thing we do, we're unloving. So that tells me, I don't get it. Like, it was interesting in my recent discussion that I had with a group of about 50 or 60 people in uh, England, and one man up the front was very rude and interruptive all the time, and I said to him, I'm here to speak with you about love, and you're demonstrating through your conduct that you have no understanding of it, and yet you want to ask me questions about everything else. And yet, and yet you're being rude, he was being rude, interrupting other people's questions and everything. And after a while I had to ask him to leave. Now he, he was a man who intellectually thought he was very developed, that he understood all of these different things, and yet his very actions were proving that he had no understanding of what I was talking about at the time. Yeah. And, and this is what we need to be aware of if we are truly going to develop and truly understand the universe. We need to begin by understanding love. And we need to begin by understanding the only reason why I don't understand love is because I don't have a love of truth, and the only reason why I don't understand have a love of truth is because I'm not humble enough to accept the truth. And if we understand those basic principles, we can grow immensely in our life. And somebody asked me earlier, I think it was Johan, to describe myself and Mary's progression through our life from 2,000 years ago to now, and it all happened because of these things. Not because of... At the beginning, I understood none of this. None of it. And I, I personally had not experienced any of it. And it was only through understanding this that I came to understand that. When I say understand, completely understand how it all works and how it all fits together and what goes on. But that was impossible without first understanding this. And I, I feel the comment that you've made is very true that the proof in the earth is that we, we are not that attracted to love yet. For, we, because the proof is we look around us and we can see that love isn't what, what guides our entire society. It's other things. And, uh, and if you look at the different ways that nations work with other nations, you can see quite clearly that love doesn't guide nations, unfortunately, yet. My feelings are, in the future, once some of us make this switch over into having a more of a fascination with these topics, now we'll have the ability to change our soul, now love will guide, eventually, communities and then nations. And once love guides nations, it's going to be amazing what happens on the earth after that. Because once you're in a loving environment, you are free to investigate everything else. But when you're not in a loving environment and we're worried about our day-to-day -day health and our day-to-day -day welfare and our day-to-day -day activities and whether we're going to die tomorrow or not because of a war or some kind of attack or terrorist thing or whatever, now we can't develop as freely because we don't have an environment that's been created for development. It's the same as you place a child. Every single child is capable of learning, yes? Very, very rapidly. There was one child that I met, five years of age, seven languages. Spoke seven languages. Just because of a combination of events that happened in its life, and, and it had the grandparents and the parents all knew different languages and they all spoke them very regularly. The child grew up five years of age, seven languages. Now, now I, I, don't, I don't know the English very well, <laughs> as you can often see. Um, now, why is that? Because there's an impediment to learning that's created in our very young environment. That, and the impediments to learning are all about fear. They're all about what happens in our childhood environment that causes us to fear that causes us to feel emotions that are unpleasant, that we, can't, we feel like we can't feel. And 
what we need to do collectively is change our environment so that love allows learning. You see, see, love, fear doesn't allow learning. Love allows learning. And when we love each other, we now are allowed to have different opinions and different points of view. So what I'm presenting here, you don't have to agree with. I love you enough to allow you to not agree with it. Right? Now, the problem with humanity generally is we don't love other people enough to allow them to have a different opinion. But the other problem we have is that we all don't understand love enough to see what love would do in any particular situation or, or circumstances. So, so I feel that these are the crux of our development. This is wild fascinating and I do find it fascinating personally. All through my life I've found physical things and, and scientific things fascinating. That's always been the case. But I still see more, I still feel more fascination about this. If I can put it another way, to me this is the skeleton by which, or the laws by which, this operates. So when I talk about this, I'm talking about how everything works together. When I talk about this, I'm talking about what works. This, I'm talking about how it all fits. And to me, that's why, to me, this is more fascinating. It has a much more fascinating interest for myself. And particularly the aspect of love and truth and my own humility have a far more fascinating effect on me than discussing this. Now, discussing this is great from an understanding perspective and helping you to come to terms with what might be ahead of you. But if you understand this, you will accept anything that's ahead of you, no matter what it is. <laughs> do, do you understand the difference? So th this here describes something that I've personally experienced, but, but it doesn't help you in that it doesn't help you cope with it. It doesn't help you absorb it. It doesn't help you experience it. This is what will help you experience it. This part. So this is why I see the difference between the two subjects is very, very important. Yeah? That being said, I'm happy to discuss these principles because all of us uh, are obviously fascinated with different spiritual things that are going on in our lives. And it's lovely to learn from somebody or to discuss with people who have already been there to a degree. So, you know, when I'm sitting down with a, um, with a scientist discussing things like uh, radiation, for example, then I'm fascinated in that discussion. It's not something that I've personally been involved in much in my life, in this life in particular. And so I'm fascinated with that discussion. I, I want to absorb that. But I understand that understanding that is all about this too. Exactly the same. Everything you're telling is, in my, my mind, finds it positive and wonderful. But since you started talking, I feel um, physical tension and pain. Mm -hmm. and Tension in one way, um, it's, I know, I've experienced before, but this very located pain, I've not. It's on your left hand side up? Yes. In your shoulder? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't understand. I, I understand that this is a resistance. I feel it. Well, there's a combination of things happening for you. Well, one, one firstly is your own fear of self-determination rises in you. In other words, any, any time I generally say to an audience, look, you have the power to determine truth within you. You have the power to determine it by using these basic principles. People then uh, become a little afraid because it means they have to be um, more reliant on the process that occurs mm -hmm. rather than actually um, knowing in advance the process that's going to occur. It's a bit like... If you, if you go out, let's say, let's say somebody said to you, would you like to come flying a plane with me today? And you'd go, oh, oh, okay, I'll come flying a plane with you today. And, and what we're going to do is uh, we're both going to strap a parachute on our back and once the plane gets up to you know, 15,000 feet or whatever it is, we're both going to jump out. <laughs> and you go, okay. <laughs> Um, now, you, if you were still interested in that process of jumping out of the plane, you would want to find out quite a lot, wouldn't you? 
don't you think? Mm. And rather than just engaging the process, uh, what would you start doing? And because of our fear of what might happen, we realise it's a life or death situation, yes? So we start worrying. We start worrying. And what do we do then? We ask lots of questions when we worry, generally. Or we don't do it at all. <laughs> One of the two. So you start worrying, you start asking lots of questions. What are the questions that you might ask? Is, is the shoot packed <laughs> properly? Where do I put it on my back? Is it, is it on? <laughs> Those kind of things. How do I pull the cord? What goes on? What happens? We may even start even, because of being afraid of what might happen, start, what if this and what if that? We ask all these other questions as well, generally. Now we're doing that because we're afraid of the potential outcome. We ask lots and lots and lots of questions. Now, it's good to ask questions, definitely good to ask questions. But some of our questions are born out of fear and not desire. They're not born out of a desire to know, they're born out of a fear of knowing. Do you understand? What, what is it going to mean for me if I know? What, what, what is it going to mean for me? What changes am I going to have to make if I ask? So then we don't ask a lot of the times. Now, what's happening for yourself is that this fear rises in you of this process, like discovering this process and living in this process. And then a woman who's with you in the spirit world connects to that and then starts trying to suppress that process. So she start, she's now going to you, I don't, I don't know if this is right, this is not sounding good to me. This is, so now all of her doubts get reflected at you and pressed upon you. And it will start, start causing pain. Now in the past, you've done pretty much everything she's suggested to you, so there's no pain. When there's a feeling inside of you of doing something different to what she sh see, she's suggesting to you, now she's not happy with that choice. And because you're open to that influence, you're open to the pain she creates as a result. And it's to do with your feeling of responsibility okay. for women, and therefore for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The fear of taking personal responsibility. In the past, you take less responsibility, you have a spirit telling you what to do. Then you don't have to feel like, I'm having to take my own choices and decisions. And of course, you're going to attract a spirit who doesn't want you to make your own choices and decisions. She wants you to make the choices and decisions that she wants for you. Yeah. And now when you contemplate this information, you're starting to have to look at having to make your own choices and decisions without her help and assistance. Now, if she's, she's upset with that, and you are too. She's upset because she can't now tell you exactly what to do. And you're upset because now you don't have somebody making you feel safe every time you do something. And so there's an automatic pain. Creation in the shop. Does that Yeah. That's the background of what happened. I could have just said it all in two words, couldn't I? You've just got a spirit with you who's causing you pain because of your feeling of not wanting to take personal responsibility. That's a summary okay. of what's happened. Um, if we have to get up to the second, when the second um, dimension before we can have this soul union mm -hmm. and reincarnate, how many times um, have we reincarnated here? Like in general, is it possible? Except for myself, okay. all of you have reincarnated zero times. <laughs> for myself and my Mary, Mary, my soulmate, we have reincarnated one time. <coughs> that takes a long time. And um, not necessarily, we'll discuss that. Uh -huh. But I'll also discuss this as well, why this is the case. You see, you see there's this constant viewpoint by people who discuss reincarnation uh -huh. that reincarnation is essential for your spiritual progression. And it is not true. Uh -huh. You do not have to return to Earth ever again. Uh -huh. Ever again. Ever again. <laughs> to grow, you do not have to return to Earth. In fact, these whole dimensions are about growth without returning to Earth. And you know what? By the time the third dimension is experienced, almost all people who believed in reincarnation on Earth now no longer believe in it. 
And by the time the seventh dimension is reached, there's not a single person in the seventh dimension who actually believes in reincarnation as it's taught on earth. Not a single person. Mind you, there's not a single person in the seventh who actually believes in Christianity in the way it's taught either, <laughs> or, in, or in the Muslim religion in the way it's taught either, and so forth. Okay. Because they've all had to make changes. Yeah. Well, then when we get information in the re uh, regressions, for example, Ah, we have well, ideas that we've been here, there and everywhere. Yeah, well, there's an answer to all the questions. So what we'll do is describe the process, and then what I would love for you to do is to ask the questions about, well, why is this happening? Why does that happen? Why do people, like you said, have regressions and what's going on there? Yeah. What, what does it mean, past life regression? You know, surely there's a past life involved. And there's an answer, when we know the truth, there's an answer to every question. Does that make sense? Going back to the truth, uh, I heard before that living in truth makes you strong and free. Means that everybody that's not doing their job they want, they are not strong and they are not free. Exactly. And that makes them sick. And that's the reason why in the long term, doing what you don't want makes you sick. Well, actually, doing what you don't... Uh, what makes you sick, really, is a lack of love. Now, if you're not doing what you want, then you're not loving yourself. So there's a lack of love. And it's always a lack of love, either aimed towards yourself or towards another, that makes you sick. Always. There's some unloving feeling, emotion, behaviour that creates all illness. Right? Now, remember the truth is the doorway to love. So, so once we realise, oh, I'm sick, so, you know, like I get a virus, and, uh, and so I'm sick, now I can actually feel my way into it as to what it's about, what the truth is about what makes me sick. And sometimes you'll find it's a lack of love towards yourself, other times you'll find it's a lack of love towards others. And you'll find all sorts of emotions involved, the truth, there's truthful emotions involved in every illness. So that occurred, that's the case for every disease, and it's also about the body's response to every germ and every virus. Now, if you think about it, our bodies carry around literally millions of different types of viruses and germs on a daily basis. So why aren't all of you a terrible mess at the moment? It's because your body has this mechanism inside of it that allows you to fight these particular germs and diseases. Now, it's only when we get that mechanism out of harmony with love that our body then finishes up absorbing some of these and responding to them. And this is one thing we need to understand about disease. But do we talk about disease or do we talk about reincarnation? Which one do you want? I was asking. Which one do you want to ask about? Of course, that one. This one? Yes, yes of course. Yes. I wanted to ask you about, uh, I mean, if you take a person that is uh, focused on love and take another person that's not focused on love, and if you take a look at the a successful life, for instance, a successful life, I mean, having a career and having a lot of money and you can do whatever you want to do. Yep. Yeah. So you couldn't say that the, the person that actually is focused on love, competed with a person that's not focused on love, uh, would have any benefit in the world. I mean, you couldn't say that in the world. I disagree. Huh? The person okay. focused on love yeah. in the world is going to benefit immensely. Yeah, okay. Yep. But you couldn't see, I mean, you couldn't say that that person has been very focused on love and you can see he's uh, living a very g good life today and the other people that is not focused on love, he, he, he has failed. Um, yeah, <coughs> see, I feel if a person's focused on love, they would never judge another person as failing. No. For a start. Okay. So, so I don't see anybody as no. failing, no. No. even if, uh, you know, they're... They're a person living on the streets in the middle of Sweden in the cold, you know. Mm. Like, like, I don't see them as failing. Um, I see them as having, they, there's some emotions of love, truth and humility that need to be worked through, just like all of us. Can I answer the question yeah, for yeah, um, yeah. the And the issue is though, that when we are truly in harmony with love, all of our life will change. <coughs> and that is a guarantee. It will all change. And we will become more and more and more successful if 
it truthfully changes, if our heart changes. The problem that we have on earth is that we have a tendency towards the facade. In other words, we have a tendency to act lovingly while at the same time not feeling loving. Now, we notice this all the time in Sweden, actually, uh, just since we've been here. Like, the other day, um, myself and Mary just walked, we were walking out, out walking, we come home, we're about to open the door, and Mary was just taking a little bit of time with this swipe thing that, you know, that opens the door. And this woman come rushing up behind, pushed me out of the way, looked at Mary, said, I'll do that, like, to, with her own, opened the door, and through she was gone, and in that moment, she'd just come back from jogging, in that moment, very self-absorbed, not considering the other person at all, like just, just total barred through. I notice this happens quite a lot in, in the supermarket here, where people almost push you out of the way, they don't ask you to move out of the way or things like that. Has that been your experience? Or? Like, yeah. In Australia, our supermarkets have vials that are three times wider. <laughs> so, so you don't really have to barge anybody out of the way. But, uh, but the, the issue there is obviously a, a lack of love. Like in the sense of love is not being displayed in that particular moment, right? Now, now the majority of us, um, if, if that lady who did that with, uh, and shortly after she actually projected sexually at Mary as well, she actually had a sexual feeling towards Mary, which considering that I'm with Mary is not a very loving thing to do to Mary, uh, but she did it anyway. And uh, another thing that's out of harmony with love, right? And, and if you look at that situation, you could go, okay, there's a woman acting like we've only spent 15 seconds in her company and already there's two or three things out of harmony with love like that the person's done. Now, if you stopped her and grabbed hold of her and said, you've been unloving two or three times now, she would go, no, I haven't. Like, what are you talking about? She, she, she would never agree with that statement. And, uh, and possibly for many years to come, won't agree that she was loving in that particular, un unloving in that particular situation. And this is the issue we face. The issue we face is the facade of love is acceptable to us all, rather than it really being love, right? The facade of politeness is acceptable to us all, instead of us really learning how to be polite, but from the heart, I mean. And we become addicted to the facade. We, we actually think the facade's real. We believe I'm loving even when I'm not, you see? And this is where we're out of humility now, we're out of truth now, and we're now loving the facade because it's easier than to actually change inside. Now what I'm proposing to people is that to actually become more loving, something's got to change inside. Inside the heart, something's got to change. Not an action. You don't have to change your actions, you have to change the heart. Because if you change the heart, the actions change automatically. If I change the cause, the effect is my actions will change automatically. Now, for many of us, we've got to try to be loving. <coughs> the reason why we've got to try is because there's an emotion in us that we're working against that wants us to be unloving. And what we need to do is we need to get that emotion somehow out of us and instead, that'll, once the emotion's out of us, that will leave us free to actually do the loving thing. Now, that's the only way the human race will change, really, really change. We can act a facade, you know, like put on a face of love, but unfortunately it's not going to be permanent, and as soon as any stress comes along, or any tricky situation comes along, or any violence comes along, or any other thing like that is stressful to us individually comes along, we will automatically revert to the animal. We'll all automatically revert to the unloving proposition. And that's the thing we face. If we, if we change what's inside of us, get that out, there's nothing to revert to other than love. We will always revert to love, no matter how violent anyone is with us, no matter how attacking they are, no matter how friendly or terrible they are to us, we will act in a loving manner in each situation and circumstance. Yeah? Yeah.
Uh, I just, I'm not sure if this was uh, part of your question, but just following on from your question. Um, it, I'm, while I feel I have the belief that love is the most powerful force in the universe, it does often seem that, peop that many people on earth who are unloving seem to succeed mm -hmm. and seem to have a lot of yeah. wealth and mm -hmm. seem to control things. Mm -hmm. And those who are loving are seemingly powerless. Mm -hmm. Now, I have some feelings different to that, but it is something that I do come up against emotionally from time to time. And I just wondered if you could talk about why that. Sure. We live in a fear-based society, do we not? Right? Totally fear-driven, fear-based society. Because fear is our ruler, anybody who subjugates themselves to fear will become successful. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Can you repeat? Subjugate means if I, if I let myself be ruled by fear, I will become successful. No, I'm saying fear is the ruler on this planet at the moment. Fear is the ruler. So while I am willing to live in fear, I will be accepted. I will be treated the same way as everyone else is treated. Because I am subjecting myself to the same rules. But as soon as I stop at subjecting myself to the same rules, I am attacked. Until love is the ruler of this world, fear will be the ruler. Do you understand what I'm yes. saying? Yeah. Now, while fear is the ruler, anybody who lives in harmony with the fear the most will be perceived to be the most successful. In other words, everyone who lives in harmony with the rules will be seen to be the most successful. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. But now let's say love is the ruler. Let's say love was a ruler. How many of us are successful now? <laughs> Not very many of us, yes? Because we have different unloving and fear-based behaviours, right? If, if love was the ruler of the whole world, then only would, when we're in harmony with love would we be seen as successful. Can you see the difference? Yeah. It's all to do with our perception. Yeah, but how could love, uh, I mean, actually be the most uh, greater thing that uh, when we are talking about it, um, we have not, I mean, normally uh, a focus on, on love or, or that part that you are talking about. So how could, how could we, I mean, get love to be the main thing for us? Well, I already feel that for the majority of people on the planet, there is this belief system inside of ourselves that, that something's wrong. Is that not the case? The like, majority of people on the planet believe something's wrong with the planet. Like, the most general people feel that. Because, because we're not living harmony, in harmony with love, we have a lot of wars, we have a lot of trouble, strife, we have a lot of violence and all these different things. So most people feel to a degree upset with that. And I feel the reason why most people do is because inside of ourselves there's a different ruler than what's outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. The ruler inside of ourselves is generally more to do with love. Now you think about that. The majority of us want to fall in love sometime in our life. Mm -hmm. Do we not? Mm -hmm. And if we have not fallen in love sometime in our life, we often feel quite separate or alone in our life as a result. And I put to you that's because inside of us there is this natural affinity towards love if we are given full allowance of the emotion. So if we're allowed to experience the emotion of love, we want to experience it more than we want to experience any other emotion. So the majority of us would, if we were asked what success, the majority of us would, uh, would probably respond being happy and in love with whatever it is we're in love with, right? The majority of us feel that that's what brings us joy and fulfillment. And yet, our day-to-day -day life generally isn't a reflection of that. Because we're doing so many things because we're afraid. Right? And 
fear, like I said, fear is the ruler of the world. So, so while fear is that ruler, I'll feel drawn into the fear. Right? So what it needs for us to all change, what it needs is all of us to stop listening to our fear. We all need to stop listening to our fear. Our fear is just a false expectation appearing real to us, and we need to recognise it. It's just all false. It's not real. It's of our own creation. We, we are afraid because we create things out of harmony with love. That's why we're afraid. Violence is a creation out of harmony with love. That's why we're all afraid of violence. Because it's out of harmony with love. Yep. And what we need to do instead is change the ruler firstly within ourselves. Now, for the majority of us, there is a, there is a, um, a spark of love within us. Right? But at the moment, fear suppresses it most of our life. Right? What we need to do is change the dynamic within ourselves firstly, where, where the spark of love is more important to us than the fear. That's what we need to do. We need to make that change, emotionally make that change. It has to be an emotional change. It can't be, I'm going to try to love more, I'm going to try to love more here. It has to be a feeling that changes so that inside of us we want love more than we want fear. Once we do that, then individuals will have changed. Once those individuals change, anybody in the community will feel that change. Then they will wonder, well, why is that person happier than I am? And they will probably want to change. And so forth and so forth until the community changes and so forth. Now, to me, that doesn't take a long time because there is these other scientific facts that we need to understand about love. One scientific fact is it takes very, very few people on earth in a place of pure love to change the world. That's one scientific fact about love that we don't understand, you see. And it changes, it takes millions of people in fear to harm a person and bring them to fear, but it only takes one person in love to change millions of people who are in fear. Right? And that's a, the capacity of our soul. So, if I focus on love, and I sincerely change inside of my soul. It can't be an intellectual change. It has to be a heart-based change. Once I do that, everyone around me will start changing automatically. They'll start being attracted to different things. They'll automatically feel more attracted to wanting to change themselves because of the state I'm in. I don't have to browbeat them or, you know, teach them all these things from childhood onwards or anything like that. I don't have to get up on a pulpit and yell and scream at them because they're wrong and all any of those things. All I need to do is change myself. Once I get into a, a better condition of love, every single person around me will change. Guaranteed. This is, a, this is the underlying law of love. The problem for the earth is that we've never experienced it very much. And so, but, but we have examples. You know, Gandhi was an example. What happened around Gandhi? Millions of people changed around him. You know how many people were at his, at his funeral? Far more than anybody has ever been at any other person's funeral in history. Yeah? Literally millions of people watched it, but, but millions were actually present at his funeral because he changed their life by living truth and love. And that's, that's one person. That's the capacity all of us have. Exactly the same capacity in our lives. And that's what we've got to remember about love. Yeah. The problem is that the, that the world's ruler is fear, and so we even at times find fear quite attractive. And the problem is with fear is that fear always is associated with violence, the potential for hurt, and all of those kind of things. And so when we're threatened... By, by the potential of violence, the potential of hurt, now we revert back to our fear rather than living in harmony with love. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between living, between um, fear and living in harmony with love? Is it feeling our fear, fear and, and living it? 
No, it was um, feeling your fear and stop listening to it. Yes, yes. So what's the difference there? Well, fear has a message. It's like a, it's like it tells a story. Yes. Now, when I feel my fear, I allow myself to feel the actual body sensations of my fear without allowing it to tell me the same story. So that's not listening to it. That's not listening to it. So fear would normally say. So let's say, let's say, um, for for an average woman. And um, let's say there's this big biker dude, big biker fellow, right? Big large fellow. He's got long hair, tattoos. He's got half of his uh, body showing, you know, over his vest. And, and he's walking up to you, and you're the only person in the street. You're the only person there. And he's walking up to you, and he's looking straight at you. How does that feel? Now, for most women, they would go into some level of fear because there is this underlying society thing that that's the kind of person who might attack me, who might rape me, who might harm me in some way, so forth. Now, of course, if he came up with an angry sort of look on his face, it would be even worse, wouldn't it? But if he come up with a smile on his face, you'd feel a bit more relaxed, wouldn't you? Yeah? But can you see, as he's coming up to you, you're telling yourself a story. The fear is telling you a story. Now, you have a choice now. You either live in that story, or you challenge your fear. Right? Now, if you live in the story, what might you do? You see him coming, and he's looking at you, and he's about 20 metres away. You go, where's the next shop? You know? <laughs> and into the shop, right? Or something like that. That, that is you responding to the same story. Now, do you see? You are now listening to your fear, but you're not feeling it. You're avoiding it. Yeah? Now, what I would do is I'd say, right, my law of attraction has brought this character into my life. And uh, it doesn't take me, I don't even think about that anymore. I just think every event's like that. It's brought me, in, it brought me him into my life. There's a feeling that I have. This is the reason why. I, he's in my life. Because... I need to feel this feeling. So I feel it. The moment I feel it, I've changed something now. I'm no longer listening to the story, but I'm feeling the emotion. I'm humble to the actual emotion. So you're not trying to push it away? You're not trying to push it away. You're not trying to manage it. You're not trying to make it go away by taking an action. You're humble to feeling the sensation within your body, feeling the emotion. You know, in that moment, I've had people who have a cross look on their face, all of a sudden smile at me. Just from me acknowledging the fear that I have. An instant, it's an instant reaction. And that's where if you change inside, you're not living the same story anymore. All fear comes from a prior story. Do you understand what I mean by that? A story that has happened in the past. Right? So all fear comes from stories that have happened in the past. Ironically though, the majority of them are not even your own. They're somebody else's story that happened in their past. That you've now accepted. Right? Even. Do you understand what I mean by that? I'll give you an example. When you hear of the word terrorism, what happens? Have you ever had any terrorism here in Sweden? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah? How recently? In a small scale. On a small scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Was it act active terrorists or was it just more individuals or what, what was it? Suicide in a car in Stockholm mm -hmm. last summer. A bomb? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. yeah? So that's happened. Now, did that happen to you? No. No. But because it happened, there's this automatic acceptance of the fear involved with the story. Can you see? Because it did happen. You know, I see Swedes who come to Australia. How many of you have heard that Australia has the ten most poisonous snakes in the world? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I see Swedes doing in Australia? Okay.
And I'm walking around as if they've got to scare every snake. <laughs> I've seen that happen. And I go, what are you doing? Oh, there's snakes here in Australia. I go, yeah, but? <laughs> Stop me. Oh, because I've been told that if I make noise, they won't come to me. Okay. <laughs> Myself and Mary, we walk very silently everywhere, very rarely if ever see a snake. And if we do, it never bothers us. So, so, and yet we've got the ten most poisonous snakes in the world. And we also have, I think, some of the most poisonous spiders in the world. There's one spider that lives near our tent that's about so large, it's almost the size of a dinner plate, one of your dinner plates, right? <laughs> So when he crawls up the side of the tent, and you see, see, you see that a lot of people will get a bit afraid of all of that, right? And uh, and why is that? Now this that spider's never bit that person. How many of you have actually been bitten by a spider? One, two, three. I have. That makes four. And yet, how many of us are afraid of spiders? A lot more people. Now where did that fear come from? It's got to have come from the story. Do you see? It's got to have come from something else, someone else. It's got to have a source other than ourselves because it never happened to ourselves. And this is what we've got to be careful with fear, is that fear often is the absorption of other people's stories. Yeah. Okay, when I went to Australia, um, I talked to my dad twice, I think. Yeah. And um, we talked and he said, oh, what about dedication if the snake is biting you and whatever? Yeah. And I said, oh, yeah, just, I don't want to hear that stuff. Yeah. And then I went out and I, it was twice that I stepped, that I, I didn't step on the, on the snake, but it was short, short week, it was short. Right week. in front of you. Yeah, it was right in front of me. Yeah. And it was close when I talked to my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It was twice. And this is the trouble with stories, is we start feeling something <coughs> and then all of a sudden the attraction occurs. Yeah. And uh, like in Australia there is a snake that can kill you in two minutes if it bites you. It's called a taipan. Right? It's a, not a very big snake, it's only a, a, a metre and a half, two metres long at its longest generally. They do come longer. So it's, <laughs> when we say not very big, I suppose that's different. <laughs> big is like 10 metres long python or something. Uh, so this is a couple of metres long, very thin sort of a snake, uh, it's, uh, grey, silvery grey sort of colour most of the time. And uh, we have quite a lot of them uh, around our property. We never see them, we know they're around there, but very rarely if ever see them. And, uh, and, yet, and yet it can kill you in two minutes. Like, it doesn't matter where you are in Australia, it's pointless trying to get medication for it, right? Uh, of some kind. But, but you know how many people die in Australia from the Taipan bite? Every year? Zero. Zero, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Like, there's very, very few people who die over history, there's been very few people who've died from them, but there's been lots of people afraid of them. But I think also for me, the fear is not so concrete. I'm not so scared of meeting people. It's, it's much more subtle. For you, what do you say in English? Subtle. Yeah, it's yeah. much more, and it's not. It, it's. Yep. The reason why that is the case is that most of our fears are actually not about physical events, but rather about emotional events that occurred in our childhood. Right? And this is the problem with our fears, is that most of our fears had their birth in the treatment we had when we were a child, in some way. And that's why they are often very subtle and difficult to, uh, difficult to intellectually grab hold of. What we need to do instead is just feel the fear, and when we feel the fear, we will actually usually be able to associate it with an event that occurred that uh, was an emotional event for us. So, for example, my fear, I'm not so scared of fire spiders anymore, but when I was a child, I was quite afraid of spiders, because I can re and I remembered the entire event. The event was, I picked up a redback spider when I was about two years of age. Now, a redback spider is like a black widow. 
You understand? In Australia, it's got a red stripe down its back. Bright red, like uh, no one here's got bright, the bright red colour that it's on its back. Um, it's close to that scarf, but a bit brighter red. And down its back. And I'm picking up and I'm looking at it, like right? two years of age. My mother comes out. What is you think she's going to do? <laughs> now, in that moment, any time anybody's in fear, they are withdrawing love from you. So now I have associated inside of myself the withdrawal of love to me picking up a spider. And she smacks the spider off and <coughs> the spider kills it. And don't do that anymore and are upset and a bit angry because her fear is being challenged, yes? And all of that is the withdrawal of love. Now, when love is withdrawn from a child, that's when it feels pain. Every single time. So every time somebody is angry with you as a child, or is afraid of something as a child around you, they are withdrawing their love from you. And in that moment, you will automatically associate what the action was, or what the different thing that was happening was, with the withdrawal of love. And you will automatically, from now on, have a degree of fear associated with that event. I have a friend, uh, when he was very, very young, his mother went onto an aircraft carrier, and you know the, the aircraft uh, lifts that pull the aircraft up and down, some of them operate very rapidly, very fast, much faster than a normal lift that you have on a, inside of a um, building. And particularly when they drop, because they're generally empty, and they drop very suddenly, and then they slowly come to a halt because of the way they're constructed. And his mother was nursing him and on top of one of these lifts, and it dropped. And it dropped unexpectedly for her. And she went into huge amounts of fear. She almost dropped the baby. It was just a young baby. And from that moment on, Gary, his name is, became afraid of heights. He's now a builder <laughs> of all professions, and he's afraid of heights. Mm. So every time he has to get on the scaffold, there's a worry and so forth. And unless he releases this emotion, this connection with the withdrawal of love from his mother at the dropping sensation, he will remain afraid of heights. Do you understand? Okay. Anyway, um, let's progress out of that subject, shall we? And back to the question that was asked. Shall we do that? Unless you want to go home. <laughs> you are? 2,000 years ago, yeah. there was a big story happening. <laughs> a big story? Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot tiny, of fear. Tiny story. <laughs> tiny story. With a lot of fear. Can you tell us about this story? Sure, sure. And the reality is my story is a tiny story. Like, you, you are born, I was born. <laughs> Tiny story. Two people got together, had sex, created, created myself, and obviously two other people got together, created Mary in the first century. Let's describe what happened though. There's God. God created all of our souls, including yours and mine, of which I am one half. I am one half. The, the, there is another half of me. Now, when Joseph and Mary, my mum and dad, uh, came together, they had sex, and my mother became pregnant with me. What happened at the time of conception was two bodies were created. Two bodies, a spirit body and a physical body. And my half of the soul became attached to them through cords. So this cord here, people call in the spirit world called the silver cord because it looks silvery. That's the reason why it's called the silver cord. It looks like a silver streak um, that you can trace one end to the other. Um, and when a person's asleep, you can actually trace it back to where it's coming from. You can see whose physical body belongs to whose spirit body in the spirit world just by tracing the call back to where it is. So I incarnated, that process is called, 
incarnated. And the whole reason why this process is created is so that you become an individual. So that in this moment, you begin to have experiences that you've not had before. Before that time, I had no experience. I was existing, but I had no awareness or self-consciousness. I had no awareness of myself, no awareness of anyone else, no awareness that I even existed. Does that make sense? So, in this state here, we have no awareness of anything at all. We have some instinctual things that occur, but no awareness of those instinctual things. Yes. The moment we incarnate and we can connect to the bodies, our bodies begin to absorb experiences. Why do you want to incarnate in the first place? Um, it's not that we want to. God created it and it has to occur. And the reason why it has to occur, God created it for what in the spirit world we call this process of individualization. In other words, the process of us becoming an individual in our own right and then growing as an individual. So for the rest of your existence, you will continue to grow as an individual if you so choose to do so. You will never become joined in another individual, another individual soul. I'm not talking about the other half, I'm talking about another complete soul. You know how a lot of uh, religions talk about the, uh, we all become God. We are all just facets of God and eventually we join together and we all become God again. God, there are some thought that God exploded herself or fragmented herself and then is joining herself back together again. That's not the case at all. We are all going to be individuals for the rest of our existence. In fact, what I've found through my own existence is the more I progress in love, the more individual I become. Not less, more. Alright? Alright? Um, I'm thinking about uh, what Eckhart Tolle is talking about, uh, letting go of the ego. And it it's, um, applies to a lot of things that you've been talking about, you know, like being truth and love. Yep. But, but that's, uh, that's more also being more a part of, of a whole, connected to everything else. Yes, remember that when I become more as an individual, it does not mean that I don't have strong connections with everyone else. Because the reality is, the more you become an individual, the stronger your connections are with everyone else. Because you have the emotional capacity to have a stronger connection. So you actually grow in the expression of your love towards all things, and so therefore you become connected with all things in a far greater way. So I'm not saying you become disconnected from your environment, but rather you become more connected with your environment. Do, do you understand the difference? Yeah? So, so Tol talks about, and many other Eastern forms of religions too, where, where he took a lot of his information from, talk about losing the ego. But see, ego to me is just a word. And the word ego to me, means a lack of humility, a lack of truthfulness about what's really inside of your own soul. To, to him, it also talks, to him and other people who are of an Eastern philosophy background, they feel that it's talking about the, emergent, the merging of yourself into others. And I don't agree with that. I feel, and I know from my own experience, that we become more individual but we become more lovingly connected to everything around us. So when you move to the, the 22nd uh, yep. uh, you're still an individual and like for eternity, but you choose to reincarnate? Uh, and I'm still an individual even reincarnated. Yeah, yeah but, but up there, I mean, you're, there's no end of the individualization. That's correct. Now, you could say that there are phases in the individualization. The first phase is the time you incarnate. And from that moment on, you now have the ability to absorb experiences. The next phase is when you become at one with God. You, as a half of a soul, enter this condition with God. 
that you now have exactly the same viewpoint about love as God has. Right? And then you continue to grow beyond that place until your soul, or the other half of your soul, has exactly the same viewpoint as you about everything in the universe. And that's a soul union. That's another phase. Now, I haven't discovered any more phases, but I'm very certain there are more phases because everything God's created has a, an, an infinite uh, capacity to it. So, so I feel this is phase number one, if you like, the actual incarnation. Phase na number two, the one with God phase. Phase number three, the individualization union of the whole soul, not just its half. And then there will be phases after that. I'm very certain there will be, because everything God creates has a, this progression to it. And so I don't feel that with anything I'm teaching you, there isn't more beyond it. However, these are the things that I've experienced and know for a fact to have occurred. That's all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why do we start uh, our lives on Earth? Um, why don't we just develop? Because uh, Earth... Uh, see, what God has done is that if, if we all began our life in our spirit body, there would be so much <coughs> sensory input that it would be almost like a sensory overload. So the beauty of a physical body is that it has limited sensory input. So that then allows us to slowly develop and absorb. It's a bit like asking me the question, why don't we all go to university when we're born? And it's the same answer. It's because if you place a baby in university, what's its capacity? <laughs> little, right? That little capacity. So little capacity to learn and absorb in that it has to go through a process of growth. And so what God has designed is a process of growth while the soul is primarily associated with the physical body, and then a process of growth while the soul is associated with the spirit body, and then a process of growth that where the soul is just itself. Does that make sense to everyone? Like a, it's a beautiful process that I, that I feel happens. So part of this university is to learn fear? Uh, no, there's no need to learn fear, but you see, we have free will. So we have the free will to learn fear. And unfortunately, people in our past, way beyond when we were born, chose to learn about fear more than they chose to learn about love. And for that reason, we are bearing the consequences of that choice. And it's just the same as you. If you choose to learn more about fear than love, then your child will bear the consequences of that choice. Now, my feelings are, if we can't change for the sake of our children, then who can we change for? So if we can't learn to do more loving things for the sake of our own child, then it's highly unlikely we're going to do it for ourselves or anybody else. So God's also created this system to look at our child, children and go, wow, I've created fear in that child. Wow, I need to look at myself you know, and change here so that this stops. And, and if we are not able to do that with our own child, it's highly unlikely we will have any stronger motivation in our entire life to do it with anyone else. Because yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the uniqueness of the earth plane, isn't it? It is that we are actually able to reproduce ourselves. Yes. And within us there is this capacity for love and bond with uh, offspring. And God is trying to teach us about her love through this through this process. process. So, so God's, God's designed a universe, and particularly the physical universe has been designed, so that you can learn about love very rapidly. And one way that God's designed for us to learn about love is to actually be able to procreate, because this gives us the ability to learn about unselfish love inside of ourselves. You see, a lot of times with our relationships, we're a bit selfish in the relationship. You, you know what I mean? Like, we get things from them, we give things to them, Feels like love, but not always love. But with a child, when it's born and it's crying and, it, and, and it's got, you know, it's just, just newly born child, needs all of our care and attention. Now we're learning about unselfish love more. We're learning how to love something without it giving in return. Without it actually giving us a feeling in return. Now, many of us start to demand feelings from a child, unfortunately. But, but we're already being taught how to love more by having a child, generally. So, so the beauty about the Earth existence, and there is no um, 
uh, there's no ability to create the spirit body or the physical body in the spirit world. So it's only available to us on earth. It gives us this unique experience of being able to learn about love in the most rapid possible manner, which is God's design. God designed the universe that way. Uh, I'm just pondering it for myself as well, but there's also the issue in that it seems to me that there's a greater quality to the love that we develop in the earth plane, in that once we reach the spirit world, it's immediate, the feedback, when we step out of harmony with love. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute, I think. Whereas, yeah, yeah. on earth, we must develop that internally. Yeah. Is that Yes, and see, here on earth, what Mary's talking about is here on earth, we have the ability to do the wrong thing and do the right thing and do things in between. We have a wide scope of potential activity that we can have. Right? Now, in that wide scope, we don't receive immediate feedback as to the choice we just made. So if you take an unloving action, for example, there's not an immediate feedback for the unloving action or behaviour, right? There is a feedback system, and as you develop, you will find yourself becoming more and more sensitive to that. But, but, it, but there's not the seeming immediate response or penalty associated with taking an unloving decision. In the spirit world, if you take unloving decisions and choices, there is an immediate response, right? And, and that causes people to make change without change necessarily needing to be sincere. Do you understand? In other words, it causes people to live in a... In the spirit world, I mean, they make some changes, particularly on the natural love path, which is the first six dimensions. I'll talk about them in a sec. It causes people to make changes without the changes being in the soul. They're in the mind only. And... and on earth, the changes we make have to be in the soul. We learn to do them in the soul if we're sincere about it. We learn to do it in the soul. When I say have to be, the only way you're going to make sincere changes on this planet is by doing it in your soul. And the reason why I say that is because if you do it in your mind only, when nobody is around and there's nobody else other than just you and God, you'll be drawn to take unloving decisions and actions that you would not have normally done when other people were around. Many of us already do that, right? Like, how many men would watch pornography as long as no one's around in comparison to watching it when somebody's around? Or, let's be more specific, how many men would watch pornography as long as there's no one else around um, or there's other men around watching pornography rather than watching pornography when they're with their own partner. Can you see the challenge of it is greater when other people are around generally? That's the, that's the truth of things. So, so what often happens with our development on earth is that we have this... Uh, th there has to be sincere changes towards love on earth for us to actually make major decisions and choices that are different. Oftentimes, we don't make sincere changes and we only do things differently because people observe. Does that make sense? Whereas in the spirit world, when we arrive in the spirit world, everything is automatically as we've created, and I'll describe some of the spirit world to you, and maybe in another talk, about how automatic feedback is given. You can see your own body. Now, have any of you watched the movie... Um, or read the book. Uh, Dorian Gray. Sorry. Dorian Gray. Is that what you're yeah, Dorian Gray. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Some of you read Dorian Gray. And it's a story about a man who does evil things, and he goes to a mirror, and all of a sudden his face has changed to reflect the evil thing he did. It's a portrait. It's a portrait. Um, what happened was somebody painted a portrait of him, and then as he does things that are evil, the portrait changes and looks more demonic. It looks more like, looks like he's degraded his condition. Now, for most of us, that is what is happening on earth. Every time we live out of harmony with love, there's something in our physical, in our spirit body that actually changes and our condition looks worse. 
The whole reason why we age is because our body changes towards the, towards the point of it looking the same as our spirit body. Do you understand? I don't know if any, all of you got that. The reason why we're aging is because our body is actually changing to approach what our, what our spirit body actually looks like. Do you understand? So, so the reality is if we were in more love, our spirit body would be in a very, very young condition and our physical body, we could be 100 and look 25. Right? In other words, our physical body would change to meet the condition of our spirit body. But for the majority of us, our, spirit, our physical body is changing and looking older and more haggard. And, and eventually we get so aged and decrepit in our body, because that's now a mirror of our spirit body, that we actually can't sustain life anymore. And we pass. And that's why we pass. It's the reality of why we pass. If we, um, we're living in harmony with love and truth and humility, and we were at one with God, we'd look around 25 years of age or so. All of us. It doesn't matter whether you're 100 or, or, or 25. <laughs> you still look 25. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Right? Yeah. So the, the, the spirit body, the physical body approaches the age of the spirit body and that tells us, that's a beautiful feedback system that tells us that obviously there are things that are out of harmony with love. If we're getting older and more wrinkled and everything's happening, right? that's what's going on. That's a bit, that's a bit shocking, is it? No, that's what I was talking about. This is, this is some of the truth. And, so, do I have to go through such a process to... Because we're God's children, yeah. so God created the soul as an image of the soul, to say, but not necessarily the body. Created those bodies to, for us to use to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, through going through the spheres, uniting with the, going through the soul union, mm -hmm. other phases to my mind may be that we may become closer to God or more like God. We'll always become closer to God, and therefore more like God. So then did God, in order for God to know all this and create this for us, mm -hmm. did God potentially go through this phase to... I can't answer that question. I haven't found the answer <laughs> from God. Because, I mean, it's, it's a... It's an amazing very process. It's detailed, really detailed and thought of to the very last. Yeah, but it, I, I, my personal experience is everything God has done is very detailed, thought of to the last little minute detail. I mean, to detail. the little grass, to the little... Yep. Like, everything. It is just amazing. So if... So you're taking us through this through your experience yep. because you know. Yep. So I'm thinking, you know, God like knows all this. Exactly. Probably God. And far more than what so, I know. Yeah. Yep. But it's just amazing. It's a, it's amazing to conceive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why my relationship with God is the most important thing to me, because that teaches me all other things. It's the relationship with the being who created this entire system that actually can teach you the most in the most rapid manner. That's why these three things are the most important. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it can teach you the most. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, I, I follow uh, often my intuition. Yep. But there was a time when I could feel uh, confused. I didn't know if it was God or some other entity mm -hmm. because I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh God, uh, can I trust my intuition? And then I understood that my heart was very sad. So obviously I connected to a dark entity. Mm -hmm. How can I check it out when I'm really, when I'm really connected to God? Well, that, Just to is, be sure nothing is around. That's a very involved question. And also I can, list, like to discuss the answer to that question, we could talk for four hours. Oh. Do you want me to summarize this whole thing first? Yes. And then we talk about the details or do I talk about the details and forget the summary? <laughs> My feelings are we talk about the summary and, and we, we deal with the details as they come along. Remember, we've got tomorrow if you want to come along tomorrow. And there's also next Saturday if you want to come along next Saturday. We can discuss a lot of things. Can I just ask you, uh, do you say, it, it would uh, I mean, matter the life that we're living on earth now compared to I mean, when we are dead? Uh, would you say that it would give us any benefit to 
live our life in, in, in love, in harmony, compared to not living it in, in harmony with love uh, after you are dead. It, it's a huge difference. Yeah. If you live your life in harmony on earth with love, yeah. there is a huge difference between what, you, what will happen to you after you pass yeah. compared to if you live your life in disharmony with love on earth, there'll be some very, very hard conditions when you pass. And this is because every time we get out of harmony with love, we actually create a different environment. So if you think about the earth environment we've created now to collectively, if you think you are also right at this moment creating your own environment in the spirit world right now. And your own environment in the spirit world will mirror exactly every single feeling you have within you right now. So if you have some dark feelings in yourself, some angry feelings within yourself, the environment will mirror those feelings. When I say the environment will mirror it, it will be a physical creation and also a location in the spirit world that mirrors completely your own current development. Now, for the majority of people who pass over in the spirit world, they pass over into the bottom half of the first dimension of the spirit world which the spirits in the higher locations call the hells. The hells. H-E-L-L-S. <laughs> they call it the hells because it ain't too pleasant. You understand? Not very pleasant locations to live, but they are a complete loving reflection of the soul at that location. Now, there are literally billions and billions of people still in that location in the spirit world, in the hells. Billions. And the majority of people who pass from the earth pass into that location. It matters not what religion, it doesn't matter what faith you have, what, what form. What matters is your development in love. That's the only thing that matters. So if you're, you can think you're developed in love, and there are many people who think they're developed in love who finish up passing in the hills because they are not developed in love. Right? And this is the problem that we face on earth, is that we are often influenced by the people in the hells, quite substantially. But they are people who have yet to discover the truth about the whole spirit world. They only have a very fixed belief system about their particular location. They've never been anywhere else. It's a bit like, how many of you have ever been to Australia? How many? Now, put your hands down, the ones who live in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, where in Australia did you visit? Do you mind? Melbourne and Sydney. Melbourne and Sydney. So if I talk to you about Cairns, you've never been there. No. Right? Um, very different climate to Melbourne and Sydney. Like Melbourne to us is cold. I have heard a lot about it because my son was there for five years studying and he's married to an Australian girl. Right, so you have some knowledge of it. Some knowledge. Yeah, okay, but never been there. And this is the problem. If you've never been somewhere, how do you know what's there? Now, I have been in there. I have been there because I've visited many people there. And I'm telling you, it is not nice. But it is a complete reflection of the person's soul condition, what they have personally created. Yes? Uh, I'm thinking it's, it's the, the effect of being out of harmony with love is directed after we were dead. Uh, doesn't that... Uh, can, can I say it's always direct? It's just that we don't see it directly when we're in a physical form. Okay, but if, if you see it directly when you're dead, mm -hmm. uh, that sounds like an opportunity to evolve fast. Spot on, and, and it is. Why is, is people uh, staying in hell for a long time, or why? <coughs> good question. Very good question. The reason why is they've become so addicted to doing their unloving things that they have to get over their addictions before they will begin to love. Do you, you know what? It, how many of you have had to give up an addiction? Like, like, yeah. How hard was it? <laughs> the majority of us. It's pretty hard, right? Yes. Isn't it? Like, you spend years and years and years sometimes giving it up, and even after years, sometimes you're still attracted to it. Yep. This is what it's like here. They are so addicted to doing unloving things, and they are so addicted to not being humble, 
that it takes them time to work through those addictions. And for many, it takes thousands of years to work through those addictions of time. Because they don't have anybody saying, you have to do it. See, see, one of the things that we have on earth still is we have law. In other words, you're driving down the road here and there's a speed limit sign that says, what, 60 kilometres per hour. And you're driving down the road and you're driving there 90 kilometres per hour. Now, now, for some of you, you'll feel like, that's fine, as long as there's no policeman around the place. <laughs> right? But if there's a policeman, what do you do? Slow back to 60 kilometres per hour, or 63, or 65, yeah. right? Now, you imagine in the spirit world, there are no policemen. In other words, you can do anything you want, but it's limited to your location. So in other words, the people in the hill, hells can only do things that the hells allow them to do. But they can do anything they want. They don't have to change. They will only change when they decide to become humble and actually want change. Now, can you see that for the majority of people on earth, we're always trying to get away with things, yes? We, want, we try to get away with doing this, get away with doing that. We want to break the rules. In the spirit world, you can do anything you want, but you are limited only by the rules of that location. There's no policeman that comes along and books a ticket and says, you shouldn't have done that, naughty boy, boy. None of that. Now, if you had complete autonomy like that yourself, do you think it would be easy or hard to change? Can you see how sometimes it would actually be harder to change if you have an addiction? Mm -hmm. So if you have an addiction to fix, that you need to fix up, it, it often is difficult to change. This is why if you learn how to change when you're on Earth, you're 100 miles ahead, 100 kilometers ahead of anyone else. Because, because you've learned how to change. You've learned the basics of your life, the basics of change. <laughs> If you pass into that location without knowing the basics of change, it could take you many hundreds and potentially thousands of years before you even have a desire to know. That's the problem. And so, so the majority of people who pass into there are very resistive to being told anything. Now, there are many people who come down from the higher dimensions who try to tell them. They say, they say to them, look, it's all about humility. Now, you imagine trying to tell a murderer who murdered most of his life on earth that it's all about humility. He doesn't understand the first time you tell him. It's highly unlikely he will understand the first time. You might have to go back many times, and it will only be when he wants to understand, generally, that you'll be able to explain it to him and he'll understand. And this is the trouble with entering the spirit world in that location, is we're so addicted two certain things that to give them up requires so much effort that we finish up not giving them up for a long time. That's the reason why. So yeah, it not be the same thing like if you go to someone or someone is asking you something and they get triggered by it, they saying you're unloving or whatever and they're not open for it. Yes. So that's the thing. Yes. How, how many, are, like, like I, I, I very rarely if ever angry with anybody, right? But often I get lots of rage, of course, I say many confronting things, that's the reason why. But, but a lot of times the people will actually tell you that you're to blame for them being angry with you. Or you're to blame for them being violent with you. Right? Now these people in the hills feel exactly the same way. That you're to blame for their pain. And they don't want to take any personal responsibility for their own pain. So if we can learn to do it here on earth, before we pass, we have a great head start. That's the thing. Well, I wonder, is it true that it seems to me I've seen people close to death being more open or uh, more open to change and more open to uh, want to release? Yes, I agree. The reason why is when they are just about to pass, they often go through this quasi-state where they're sometimes on earth and sometimes in the spirit world. And when they're sometimes in the spirit world, each of us have the opportunity to discuss things with them while they're in the spirit world. 
And what happens with most people when they pass is they have a large degree of fear when they pass. So just before they pass, they tend to hold on to life on earth. And what happens then is a series of discussions. So every time they go to sleep, there's a series of discussions with them about where they're going to live, what they're going to be doing, why that the fact that they can actually get out of that location when they go there, and those kind of th thoughts are delivered to them. People are not always happy to hear them, but usually it makes them feel safer about passing. And for that reason, they tend to have more openness to dealing with something emotionally as a result. So, so there, it, is, it is a lovely thing, this process of passing. You actually see the help. If you can see both worlds, you see the help that the person who's just in the process of passing gets in terms of helping them be absorbed into their new location. Because every place in the spirit world, we have physical locations in the spirit world. There are buildings in the spirit world, and just like these buildings on earth, they're just made of a different material. But uh, there are buildings, there's places where you can learn, there's libraries, there's universities, there's all sorts of things in the spirit world. Houses, um, just not made the same way as what you, made, you know, we have here. But uh, they are all made of different material. In each dimension it's a different subliminated material. And as a result, each dimension has huge amounts of physical matter in it that is of a different type of matter. On Earth, or in the, on Earth here, we call it antimatter. It's made of antimatter, the spirit world. And uh, there's huge amounts of matter in the spirit world that make up all sorts of things. And a person is assisted in the transition between living on Earth and now going to a location in the spirit world where their soul interacts with. Now, it's important for me to mention a few basic things before we continue. One is, every location... What, what's the time, by the way? Quarter to six. Quarter to six. Okay, we haven't got much more time today, so we'll go on to tomorrow with this discussion. But every single location is a different condition <coughs> of love. Every dimension has a different condition of love. And it increases with every dimension. So the second dimension is more loving than the first dimension. The third dimension is more loving than the second dimension. Does that make sense? Now let me explain it completely. As we grow in love, there is a point here that is the most we can grow in love without God's help. And that's the sixth dimension. That's the pinnacle of the love that you can develop within yourself without God. The sixth dimension. This is where, uh, historically, many billions of spirits have stayed for long periods of time. Some of my friends that I know in the spirit world have stayed there for a hundred thousand years or longer in that dimension. Does that make sense? Because they couldn't grow further without actually engaging God in the process of growing in love. So that's the pinnacle of what is called natural love. What we call natural love. Or the love that comes from, remember I said it earlier, the, right at the beginning, the love that comes from within ourselves. Beyond that point where I've drawn this green barrier, you must receive love from God to actually grow beyond that point. If you do not, if you choose to not receive love from God, you will not grow beyond that point. Right? Now, there are many people there who think they are receiving love from God, and they're not. So, remember that a lot of the times we think we're doing better than we are, don't we? Even on earth, even the words coming out of my mouth, many of you think you're understanding them, and I can feel that you cannot yet understand them. Does that make sense? We, we often do this. It's an automatic thing. And so many that reach there, which is a very developed place in love, it's a very beautiful location to live. You can live there for many thousands of years and be completely happy. Yes. But you can't grow beyond that the location without receiving God's love, without receiving love from God. So it's important to understand there's this development in love all the way up, but there is a limit 
to love when you are self-sufficient. When you have a self-reliance, the limit to love is the sixth dimension. Yes? Sometimes in spiritual circles it's called the sixth sphere, and sometimes they refer to seven spheres, and there's six. There's actually a lot more than seven, but many of the spirits who talk about it can't talk about what's in the eighth or so forth. Then there is a transitional sphere, a transitional dimension, which is all about you learning about God and other principles about God to become at one with God. And that particular transition is a very, very important transition in your life. That transition in the first century, I call that being born again, it transforms the capacity of your own soul. There's a physical transformation that occurs to your soul that allows it to expand or elastic, it causes it to be elastic. You understand? So before then, our soul has a finite uh, degree in which we can grow. This is the natural love. You could call that the perfect natural man or woman. You can't grow any further than that without God's love because the soul is unable to expand. It's unable to be elastic beyond that point without God's love entering it. Once God's love begins to enter your soul, the soul develops an elastic sense to it where it starts to be able to expand beyond its original creation. Yes? And this is what God's love does to your soul. It transforms your soul into a new creature. That's why I called it being born again. Yes? So, so when you look at this transformational time, it's very, very important in your future. And remember that every one of these is a layer of love. It's about development in love. So if I go from the first to the second dimension, I've developed in love. Now there is an interstellar boundary between each dimension. What an interstellar boundary between each dimension that, that is thousands, hundreds of thousands in fact, of light years across. You, you cannot cross the boundary between those two dimensions without being in a certain condition of love. So if my condition of love is the first dimension, and I'd like to go to the second dimension, I can be drawn to go there, but sooner or later I'll hit this interstellar boundary that is a boundary of love that I cannot cross. And my fear will prevent me from crossing it, or other emotions may prevent me from crossing it, and I'll be, I'll be stopped from progression. Once I've developed in love enough, in love enough, I can cross that boundary, that interstellar boundary, through my will, by utilising my will, and now I can be in, my, in the second dimension of the spirit world. And the same applies with the separation of each dimension. Now, I don't know if you realise on Earth, but at the moment I think they've proven that there is 13 dimensions, mathematically. Right? I think it's about 13 that they've proven because they don't have enough supercomputer power to do the computations to prove there's another dimension beyond that. But, but there is actually far more than 13 dimensions. Yeah. Uh, my question relates to uh, the concept of these interstellar boundaries yep. and how it fits into the physical universe or the universe itself. Like you say, it are light years and you mentioned that the spirit world is made up of antimatter. Yes. So, can you go a bit further in this? And aspect? our physical universe mm -hmm. is uh, consuming matter mm -hmm. and spewing out antimatter. And this enables the creation of other dimensional spaces that utilize the antimatter. So, this would be black holes, basically. Black holes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so, what happens is the, the, the universe. They've found now that uh, there's a number of things that they've found recently about the universe. You know, there's black hole, there's a uh, Big Bang theory. Mm -hmm. that, that it's still a theory, by the way. It's not a fact, mm -hmm. and but we teach it as a fact, unfortunately. But the reality is there is a lot of uh, scientific evidence indicating that the Big Big Bang theory it has has to make a lot of changes before it actually is exactly how the universe operates. And what they've come to realise is that the, while our own little physical universe um, appears to be the entire universe, 
what they've realised recently through some observations that I've done with special telescopes, that uh, the reality is that our physical, there may be many physical universes of the same dimensional size of our own. Right? So in other words, there's this bigger universe of which we are just one little part, and that is the reality. There is a physical universal separation, a boundary, between each one of these dimensions, between each universe. Yeah? And each one of these universes have also the creation of their own dimensional space around them as a result of the, the process that God has enabled to occur. Yeah. Starting to get a bit technical there. Can I ask you, uh, is it possible to recognize someone else when you pass away? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, although, only by feeling them more than seeing them sometimes. Because yeah. remember I said how the more that we do that is out of harmony with love, the more decrepit our body becomes our spirit body in particular. Now our spirit body can become so decrepit because of what we've done that we're barely recognisable to a person who used to live with us on earth. Right? Now the only way they can generally recognise us is through what, I, what you would classify as a soul signature, a feeling coming from the other person. I know you, you're such and such. Yeah. You know, sort of a place of remember, uh, memory. And uh, every single person in the universe has a unique signature and unique soul uh, characteristics and attributes. And the unique soul characteristics and attributes create almost like a signature coming out of us that every other person in the universe can recognise. Yes? So, so when spirits come to talk to me, they know who I am because they've recognised that signature. Does that make sense? People on earth come to talk to me, they go, oh, you're not Jesus, you know, you're nothing like that. And, and because they don't recognise that signature, they've never met me before, so they don't know who I am. Whereas the people that have met me before know who I am. Does that make sense? Yep. So every single person you've ever met, and that you remember, you, even if you pass, even if they change, so you, they might progress in love from there to there before you pass, you'll still recognise them. Even though they're much brighter, they look a bit bigger, they look happier, you know, they, they, they look 20, by the time they get the seventh sphere, they look around 30, you know, 25 to 30, when they might have passed when they were 90, and they look 90, right? But when you pass, you'll feel the soul of the person, you're, oh, you're, you're such and such, you died 58, 58 years ago, I know you, you know, like, and you'll recognise them and you'll meet up with these different friends that you've had through your life as a result of recognising them at the soul level. Yeah. Pretty fascinating. <laughs> yeah. uh, your knowledge uh, uh, came about 2,000 years ago. And uh, my knowledge of all of this came about, um, and I didn't know about anything above the 10th dimension when I died in the 1st century. So I didn't know about the soul union. I, I sort of guessed that it might be there, present, but I didn't know. I hadn't experienced it, um, but my knowledge in the first century was up to the tenth dimensional space in the yeah. universe, when by the time I had passed, but uh, that knowledge didn't come from me, it came from God. <laughs> you see, this I learned these basic principles, that's all I did, and in the process of learning this, I started absorbing truth from God, so I could start feeling God telling me things. Yeah. which I then embraced and trusted, and then I went with that process. And in the process, I made this... This was a very important transition that I made in the first century, this transition between the seventh and eighth dimension, and that I made when I was 31 years old. Right? Once I made that transition, I understood many things about love, and therefore many truths about the universe. But they killed you. Yes, but... Uh, it didn't hurt me. And how is the situation today? Sorry, how is it? The situation today. You are on us and you are uh, teaching us your knowledge. Yep. Are you in danger? And anybody who tells the truth is certainly in the world we live in, in danger. If you look around about us, any, per any person who says the truth about something, you look how much they get attacked. I think recently 
you had some kind of thing happen here, was it in Gothenburg or somewhere, where um, somebody dared to say that most of our emotional injuries come from our parents or something like that. Um, what was the actual thing? It was a, it was a child killing a, a child or children. That's right. And it was a woman writing in the newspaper that a, a child brought up in love should never do Would such never a do thing. That. And it was a and huge attack. attack on her. Yeah. So that woman who wrote in the newspaper that a child brought up in love would never kill another child, she was right. <laughs> but look how much she was attacked. Yes. Mm. Right? And this is the issue you face when you're in truth, is that, is that when you live in truth in a fear-based world, there will be attack. That's a natural consequence. We need to have the courage to face up to the attack. Does How can we secure you? Okay. Sorry? How can we secure you? You can't secure me. Why would you wish to? <laughs> um, I don't want to secure myself. Um, there is no need to, to fear those questions in your heart. You, you're worried that, that if something happens to me that you then won't know how to become at one with God. But I've already said how to become at one with God. <laughs> the basic things. So really you don't need more truth than that. I need to ask, uh, there's a lot of mumble jumble and, and things on YouTube about you, and I'm quite new to this, and one thing disturbs me that they said here, that what you have said that the world would go under 2012, and I hope it's not true, <laughs> I hope that was mumbo jumbo. There are, <laughs> there are a lot of things that are going to happen to the world this year, yes. Uh, yeah. um, I do not believe in cataclysm and there'd be nothing afterwards. No. I don't believe in that. Um, but I do feel that there will be a large amount of events that occur this year due to different forces in the universe that, uh, that, are, that are occurring. And we can talk about that at length if you want to at another time. Yeah. But I don't have any fear about it. And, the only, and I suggest to anybody who does <coughs> to actually deal with those fears. But I am also perfectly happy to answer questions about why, where I feel is safe and where I feel is unsafe and those kind of things if people want to work their way through all of those kind of questions. Yeah, and would be good yeah, I'm certainly happy to discuss those with you. Um, but bear in mind that I don't see a person dying as a bad thing. Because they don't die. Right? So it's only people who listen to me that see people dying as a bad thing. Like, I, I don't see it as a bad thing. I do see somebody being murdered as a bad thing. Can you see the difference? Mm -hmm. One is where one person is impacting the life of another, mm -hmm. whereas a person just passing under normal circumstances is a choice based on their own soul condition and what they've chosen in their whole life. Remember I said we age because of our unloving choices. So if I die when I'm 60, it'll, it'll be because of different unloving choices. If somebody murders me, well, that's a different matter altogether. That's because of their unloving choice. You see the difference. Now, I don't have any as a fear of death because I've been through these locations and, and pretty much all of them, except for the first dimension, is far better than anything here on Earth. So, so um, why would you be afraid? about passing. It's the south of Sweden a bad location. It's better not. <laughs> this one comes uh, to me. The blunt answer is yes. The south of uh, Sweden is a bad location. Uh -huh. But uh, I can discuss that with you. Okay. Where is the border? Tomorrow. <laughs> Where is the border? Where is the border? I can discuss those things with you in a, another time because we're going to end very shortly. Can I ask you, passing through the stage, Yep, this is stage. It, yeah, yes. is it the same that uh, I mean, passing from the, from your life? And um, it can feel very similar. Yes. Yeah. Um, however, um, it's not the same because you you don't have a physical body that you lose, whereas the transition between the earth and the first dimension, you actually lose a physical body. The tra other transitions, your spirit body becomes more subliminated. In other words, it becomes of a different material, but you notice it happening. It's actually you, a change that occurs within you that you notice happening in your body. Yeah, but would you say that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, when you pass away from, from the life on Earth, yep. would, it, would it be painful? 
Um, no, for, for the majority of people who pass from Earth, the pain is what happens before you pass, yeah, not okay. at the time of passing. Yeah. So in other words, if a person's tortured to death, obviously the yeah. torture is the painful experience. Yeah, okay. The death is, is the relief yeah, okay. from the pain. Yeah. So the reality is that death itself is a very uh, easy process, actually, that, that everyone on Earth eventually goes through. And it's a much easier process than what everybody on earth believes or yeah. feels. Yeah. Um, it's almost like, I used to call it in the first century, going to sleep. Yeah. And the reason why is it's almost like that. It's almost like, wait, uh, where am I now? <laughs> that kind of sensation. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the murder topic. Yep. Why does one get murdered? Is it a random event? Or no. Why do you attract being murdered? And there are a lot of soul-based reasons why we might attract a negative event. Um, I have put on YouTube a talk that was done in Melbourne in 2000... And Last year, 11. 11, was it? Yeah, at Ben's. Are you talking about Ben's? No, it's Ben's. No, it's 2000... Oh, it's Ben's? Oh, yeah. 10. Oh, 10. Yeah. And there's a YouTube discussion about... Um, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's near halfway through the discussion, so you have to sort of fast-forward through it where I talk about a rape that somebody asked a question about and how the rape occurred and all of the different events that were surrounding the rape and why the rape occurred to a particular person. Um, and if you listen to that presentation, it describes all of the different uh, forces at hand that create an event. Yeah. Yep. And you get the <coughs> big question and we're out of time. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's now about six o'clock, I think. Yes. Yes. So, um, what what if I discuss more about the basic overview of this tomorrow, um, and then we can ask questions about the different things about that that you'd like to know about? Would you like to do that? Yeah. So I would like to do something about God as well. Something about God, certainly. In this process, God is the author of it all. Obviously. We want to discover things about God. And in fact, and in fact, uh, up until the sixth dimension, if I can just state, up until the sixth dimension, often the people in those locations have their own concepts of God that are nothing to do with God's concept of God. Above the sixth dimension, you are forced into accepting God's concept of God by your progression. So in other words, you cannot become at one with God without having an accurate concept of God. That makes sense, does it not? Yes. So, so it's very, very important that much of what you learn is about God. Because, uh, because if you learn about God, you will actually now have a much greater concept and therefore become at one with God sooner rather than later. If you hold on to your own concepts of God, which is what most people do below the sixth dimension, then it can be many thousands of years before you make the transition into the seventh dimension. Because your concept of God will be challenged through this progression. Yeah. So what I've found in my own life is that a lot of people that I've met have a concept of God that God is all of us, like we are all God. And those people that hold on to that belief about God very much get stagnant in this sixth dimension. So they can progress up until that point, but they stagnate at that point. Because above that point, you start realising that God is actually an entity um, that has personality and characteristics and attributes. And uh, it's very important to understand some of those characteristics and attributes if you're ever going to become at one with God. But what do you reckon some of the most <laughs> of the attributes will be? The most important ones are all surround love. And that's the thing to remember. Well, I hope you've enjoyed yourself today. Oh, yes. And, uh, yes. and we have more to discuss.